Good to be here this morning. Glad God let us have church. Amen. Galatians chapter 4. Uh, I'll get there in a minute. Or more than a minute. Good morning, everybody. Coming in. Did you get a little bit more snow and ice than we did up there? Not much, much, much more. Uh, Matthew said they were getting about eight inches of snow out of that the other day. So, all right, Galatians 4.11. Um, there's a personal note in here um, that Paul includes in this, in this letter that he sent to the Galatians. They, of course, knew him. And... Um, they probably understood while Paul was there um, at, you know, establishing these churches in the Galatia region that he was having trouble with his eyes. And um, so, and, and, and he makes that known here that they knew about that trouble that he had. And uh, so it's the assumption that, well, it's not, there's more than assumption. He's just coming out and telling us that he's not doing so well with his eyes. And he says that in Galatians 4, verse 11. Uh, he starts out saying, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, and ye have not injured me at all. And, you know, here's, and I, I just picked up on this. Paul is the same guy who told us that our labor is never in vain in the Lord. Because he says that, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. And yet it's the Apostle Paul who tells us, where is that? Uh, now that I think of it. Uh, for your labor is never in vain in the Lord. For, what is it? First Corinthians 15, I believe. Uh, that your labor is never in vain. I need that encouragement every now and then. And apparently so did Paul. Paul needs to take a little bit of his own medicine, as we all, all of us preachers do. We get discouragement comes very easily in the ministry. Because you're dealing, it'd be, it would be like um, uh, a cancer doctor or an ER doctor, someone who actually, with their medical practice, tries to save people's lives, not just operate on their toe or anything like that. The discouragement that comes with being a doctor like that, a cancer doctor, in that you know that there's probably going to be a good portion of your patients that are going to die. Um, or an ER doctor as people come in with very critical emergencies and he does everything that he can to save their life um, and isn't effective. There, there is discouragement that comes with that because it makes you think, why am I doing this? What, what, what good am I if I can't do what I want to do? Um, and it's in every good minister's heart that himself, his family, and the people that he labors among, that they benefit from that labor, that, they, that the fruit, it's like any farmer with a crop. His hope is that he receives the fruit of his hard work throughout the year. I mean, you're talking about a year's worth of work to get one harvest in. And if, if a hailstorm comes or if a fire happens and burns your crop down and destroys your crop or whatever, all that labor that you bestowed is in vain. And then back in days gone by, if, you, if that crop went bad, what did your family do that winter? Because that was the, they didn't go to the grocery store. They ate what they raised. Generally, they ate what they raised. And if they weren't able to raise it, they starved to death. And um, so there, there comes discouragement with that work. And, and I'm not saying it's just the minister. Those of you who have been part of this church, you've seen the people come and you've seen the people leave. Some cases, you know, they're moving on. They go to a different church and you're okay with that. But in some cases, you know that they have fallen out and that there's a good chance they may never come back. And it's very grieving. It's very grievous in heart. And grief is a word related to love. 
you grieve who you love. You love people and you grieve over them because you see them not serving the Lord or you know they're not doing it. And um, it, it plays on you because you sit and think about this and you dwell on it and you go, what good am I? What good am I? Who's listening? Um, I'm going to preach a little bit about that this morning in the message. It's like raising children. Spending your whole life trying to teach them right, trying to teach them good ideas, trying to teach them good practices, trying to, teach, trying to discipline them to raise them as faithful, godly children, only for them to rebel. And that is very, because you just think, I just wasted 20 years, 18 years of my life with children that they're not serving the Lord. And so it, it, it brings discouragement. Um, verse 13, now where Paul gets into it, he says, Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And I want you to think of what we have accomplished in the way of those who can't see too well, even those who can't see at all. In the last, let's say, 200 years, um, by the way, a little point of history. Who invented the bifocal? The bifocal. Who invented that? Benjamin Franklin. Franklin. Yep. Invented the bifocal glasses. Okay. Which, that's what mine are. And I remember, I got mad first time. I'm going. And I used to make fun of Sterling because I'd work next to him. And I'd see Sterling raise his head up like that to look at something. And I'm going, what does that old man do? He's crazy. Crazy old coot. And it, you know, it, it dawned on me when I first started working side by side with him, he was the age I am now. So I'm the old coot now. And I'm going, uh, I'm not that old. Yeah. But when Paul started losing his eyes, there were no glasses. If he lost them completely, there was no braille. And in the ministry, we read. It's what we do. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Study this book. Read this book. Meditate on this book. Preach on this book. And if your eyes go, that's troublesome. So he says, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first and my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. The word angel is a Greek word. It's, the Greek word is angelos, and it literally means messenger. So when uh, Jesus told John to write to the seven angels, which are at the seven churches, um, you wouldn't think that Jesus would have someone on earth to write a letter to an angel in heaven. So it more likely is he is talking to the ministers of those churches, the messengers, the angels. And that's what Paul is sort of making the comment here, but received me as an angel of God or a messenger of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Well, this is the 21st century. There are cornea transplants, which they take from someone who is newly deceased. If their cornea is still intact, they will take them from someone who is newly deceased and transplant them onto people now. That happens quite often. Uh, but back in Paul's days, that was not even possible. But it's the idea that they were aware that he was having trouble seeing. He was having trouble with his eyes. And um, more than likely, having to have a large print edition of what he was reading rather than, you know, my, my younger days Bible is a smaller print Bible. I mean, I can still read out of it. But I'd rather have the large print nowadays, okay? And, and he actually says that in Galatians 6.11. If you look over there very quickly, 
uh, it says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Okay, same, same, same book, same letter. And um, we know that Paul used the term that they would use back then is called an amanuensis, which was there was someone who he dictated his letters to. Um, common for back in days gone by, uh, you might have had someone wealthy, but they not necessarily educated. So they would speak to someone who was educated enough and good enough at handwriting to write out the letter or write out some important document. Um, it, you, you, you learned shorthand, didn't you, in high school? Do they still even teach that? No? But she learned shorthand in high school. That was back in the day when it was assumed that she might get a job where a boss or a doctor or somebody would dictate a letter. She would have to sit and write it out very quickly instead of saying, hold on. What was those first five words you said? So you learn shorthand, so you write it out quickly. And then, of course, my natural writing looks like shorthand. But anyway, um, that, was, that was something that was taught back in the days. Now, which is really interesting, we have speech-to-text software. Or text-to-speech software. Speech-to-text software means that as I'm speaking... The software detects the words that I'm saying and writes them out with fairly decent accuracy. The company that leads in making this software is called Dragon Naturally Speaking. That, to me, that's interesting. Because the false prophet in Revelation 13 speaks as a dragon. And I'm just going, there's got to be a, there's got to be a connection there. Um, but Paul's, he, Paul at, by the time he gets to chapter 6, which is the last part of the letter, Paul then goes over to the man who's writing it out as he's dictating it. And he takes the pen and he writes, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. And it's assumed that Paul did that to let those people actually know that it was indeed Paul sending that letter. Because he has to establish his apostleship among these churches because of the damage. And I don't, I don't mention this often in teaching out of Galatians, but there was a lot of damage done in these churches because of the, of the Jewish Hebrew roots lost Doctrine, false doctrine that had moved in after Paul left. Those guys swept in. They, they influenced and convinced people that they had to follow Jewish law in order to remain saved or be saved or continue in salvation. And if they did not, they were not going to heaven. They were in essence saying Christ on the cross is not enough. You must keep the law. And they convinced a lot of people. And it's still happening now. Really burns me. It really burns me. I am zealous for setting people free and keeping people free. I am zealous for that. I do not like it when preachers preach bondage. I don't care if it's Hebrew roots. I don't care if it's cults. I don't care if it's fundamentalists giving out a bunch of rules that you've got to follow. If you don't follow them, you're not saved. I, I, I come out of that. That's how I used to, that's how I used to think. And, uh, so, but Paul has to reestablish here his apostleship and his authority. And he lets them know when he gets to the last chapter, I took the pen. You, some of you know my handwriting and know that it's me because you know that I have to write with big letters so I can see them. You see with what large letter I've written to you with my own hand. And whoever is reading this is going, yeah, that's Paul. That's him. That's his handwriting. And so I'm sure there was probably troubled meetings after this letter, this epistle shows up to those churches 
where if those bishops are going to be right with God and in good standing with the Apostle Paul, they're going to have to toss out some people who are causing trouble in their church. And I'll say this, don't be alarmed. If, because I've done it. I have done it. Sometimes I've done it in private, but there's been times, Brother Sterling was with me on one occasion, where I've done it in the presence of a witness, confronted somebody who was here about grossly, I'm not talking about did Adam and Eve have a belly button type of stuff. Okay, I'm talking false doctrine. And um, finally had to say, I'm putting you out. I am. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna have that here. Um, I had people call me and say, "Did you know so and so is doing this?" No. Well, you're our pastor, and we just thought, you know, we hate to be that kind of person, but you're our pastor. We just thought you ought to know what's going on. And I appreciate you asking, or appreciate you calling. So anyway, I'm sure that there would have been meetings after this when they. They got to the end of this letter and they said, yeah, that's Paul's handwriting. All right. That's him. Um, in Romans 16, 22, I have it up on the screen. You can mark that in your Bible. Uh, we actually have the name of the person who helped Paul write Romans. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean it was authored by Tertius. It, we know that. And I want you to think I want you to think about this. It, it makes sense at the beginning of Romans as at the beginning of Galatians and as at the beginning of practically every epistle that Paul writes, he starts out with Paul. OK, whereas when we write a letter, we start out with what? Dear. We start out with who it's addressed to. And think of the reasoning behind it. OK, you have. probably won't be able to do this with small paper there you have a scroll okay and you unroll the scroll so you can see I did it backwards you unroll the scroll so you can see right away who is from usually they would have been sealed right here would have been sealed. And then the, the message is delivered. They unroll it. So that's why on most epistles, I say most, Hebrews is um, the exception. And Hebrews actually doesn't have anybody's name in it. Doesn't have I Paul or I John or, uh, but it, I think it was Paul. But usually at the top, you'd see Paul in big letters. Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man. And then as you, as you read, uh, open up the letter, by the time you get to the end, whoever's reading it says, uh, you see how with what large letter I, I have written unto you with my own hand. And whoever's saying that would say, that, see that? That's Paul. Everybody here knows it. So they knew they had a genuine letter on their hands. Uh, Tertius was one of Paul's amanuensis, we'll use the word secretary or whatever, um, who helped Paul write out his letters. I, I think there's other names given. I'm, I can't uh, place them right at the moment. Um, but that was something that was, that was done, which again, by the way, all of these original documents are now gone, which is amazing to me. Because we have copies and we have old copies of everything in the New Testament. But we have no originals from the New Testament. We have documents that date from the time when the New Testament was being written. But we don't have any New Testament originals. Zero. No Old Testament originals. Zero. No original manuscripts whatsoever. And that was a big hang up for me on this King James issue because, you know, I went to Bible college. I got educated 
And I got told there's mistakes in all the Bibles and there's errors in the manuscripts. And, and I told a guy, show me an original manuscript, that way I can compare it. And I knew there wasn't any. And uh, Isaiah 40 settled it for me. God doesn't need original manuscripts to preserve his word. He said, all flesh is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And I went, God preserved his word past those original manuscripts because he promised that he would. So, and it doesn't hurt or affect the infallibility or the inerrancy of scriptures just because someone else is writing it out. We know it's being dictated by the Apostle Paul, and Paul seems to put his signature on it at the end of the book of Galatians. Um, and I mentioned Paul's thorn. Uh, I'm not going to go back to first, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, because I've covered that on different occasions, using different teachings. But we just seem to think that that's what he was referring to in 2 Corinthians 12, was the infirmity of his flesh, the messenger of Satan buffeted him, was that he was losing his eyesight, and uh, it was very troubling to him, because, as I said, we labor in the Word, we read the Word, we study the Word, we need to write the Word, need to write sermons, we need to take notes, and if you can't see to write, then what good does it do to write? And uh, then you have to rely on, upon memory an awful lot, and uh, so it's very troubling to the Apostle Paul, but God just refused to say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna heal your infirmity i'm not going to give you better eyes i'll just give you grace to endure it and paul was accepting of that now in galatians 4 16 am i therefore become your enemy because i tell you the truth um and that also was another concern that we have when i was young and foolish I decided that in the ministry, I wouldn't make any enemies. Yeah. That's what I decided. I came to a conclusion one day that I was going to preach in such a way as that everybody would like me. And everybody would appreciate me. And everybody would say I was doing a really wonderful job. And that we would fill the pews. And um, I started making enemies. Because I would preach certain things that were biblical. And some people, uh, the, at times, sitting in the pews, being very vocal about it, which didn't sit well with me, but God always had me chew my words carefully. Um, but I would have people sit in the pew and vocally argue with me, like during a Sunday school time. Uh, and I remember... One in particular where I just said, you know, all I did was read scripture. And if you have a problem with what I said, your problem is not with me. It's with what Jesus said. And this particular incident had to do with families. And I had a lady write me an at, uh, at, at email and I answered her back. And I used that verse. Jesus said... Uh, any one of you who loves father, mother, brother, sister before me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And what he means by that is you don't compromise what you believe and what you stand for simply because your kids are lost or your mom and dad's lost or because of family. You don't compromise that. Uh, I'm not going to hell for anybody. I love my family. I'm not going to hell for any of them. Um, and, and it, he means that. And I got an argument. A lady said, we well, always taught the family comes first. And I said, I, all I'm doing is reading the verse. That's all I was doing was reading the verse. And uh, she got pretty upset with me. And, um, she didn't like some of the things I said about the United Methodist Church, which then I found out that's where her kid was going. And I went, ah, it makes sense now. Because I came out and I said, let me tell you what they just did. They just had their scholars get together and write out a ish, an issue of the gospel where they categorize the words of Christ. Category A, these are words that we're pretty sure he said. Category B, these are words that he might have said. 
Category C was, we're pretty sure he didn't say this at all. And I'm going, what gives them the right? And that didn't sit well. So they're not here. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? If you will read this Bible, if you will love it, if you will study it, I'm not saying you will agree with me every time, but on the serious issues, you won't have a problem with it. And if something you disagree with, just hold on. To do what I do when it comes to my wife and I. If she says something I don't agree with, I don't, I don't argue back. Unless I am really tired. And then I don't have too much control. But I don't argue back. I just... Okay. And let God deal with it. Let God have it. Let God handle it. Okay. Um, anyway. So Paul says, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Paul, and Paul's saying, I'm a, I'm going to be a zealot here. Is that okay? Because they were a zealot. They were a zealot about how you go ahead. You guys went and got circumcised because they told you. That's how zealous they were. They told you you were not going to heaven. If God sees that, you're not going to heaven. That's what they told them. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. Let me give you what I think is an example of that. Because Hebrew roots means you follow Jewish law, Jewish customs, live as the Jew, think as a Jew, speak as a Jew, act as a Jew. And God will be pleased when he sees your Jewishness. That's what they say. That at the more laws you keep, God is happier with you. And that is not, that is not how it is. Period. That's not how it is. Because with God, God's only happy if you keep all of them. You've already ruined that one. So God then is pleased by our faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not our works. So he said, they zealously affect you. They want you to, they want you, if you don't act Jewish enough for them, they will exclude you. They will exclude you. Um, and again, it's not just Hebrew roots. It's in other areas, especially um, fundamentalism. I had a family, they moved to Alabama and they went to a King James church. They found a King James church. Uh, but she was told about a half a dozen times during the course of that one service that she wasn't dressed according to their standards. And so they said, you know, I get it, but why do you have to throw that in my face just because I came to visit one time? And it just, and I've been around that type of legalism to know what it is. And it is legalism. It says if you're not dressed, the way we say you have to be dressed, uh, then you're obviously not saved. You're not going to heaven. And um, I know there's standards in the Bible and I try to teach them. Uh, but let's get them. Let's get people saved and right with God first. Amen. And in fact, if they're saved, we'll let God deal with them about it. So in Galatians back back, if we go back a little bit, Galatians 2.11 to that story of how the Jewish mindset works, the Hebrew roots ideology works, or the fundamentalist idea ideology works when you're not up to someone's standards. Galatians 2.11, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Well, wait a minute, I thought Peter was the first pope. According to the Catholic Church, Peter's supposed to be the high most high vicar of Christ on earth at this time. And yet Paul corrects him and says, Peter, you were wrong. No cardinal's going to do that now. No, they don't. He's, if he's the Pope, what he says goes. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Peter was over sitting with the Gentiles eating. Now, Peter's a Jew. For a Jew to eat with a Gentile was anathema. You just didn't do that. But Peter, 
He sees the Gentiles. He goes and he's sitting down and eat with them. But when they were come, the Jews, Christian Jews, Peter jumped up and ran over to the Jews coming in the room and acts like he has nothing to do with the Gentiles. That's two-faced. Amen. Two-faced. He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And other Jews dissembled likewise with him. He, others were watching him. We're going to do what Peter did. Insomuch that Barnabas, and Barnabas was a pretty good guy, also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, he did this in front of everybody. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Peter's is going, Boy, it's warm in here. <laughs> And you do, and then you see in Second Peter, Peter is not holding a grudge against Paul. Because in Second Peter, I think it's chapter two, Peter says, "Go read Paul's letters. Go read Paul. Paul knows. Paul's telling you what I'm telling you. So he's not separated himself from Paul, saying, "Well, they're not Baptist anymore like we are." Okay, that's what he's doing. He doesn't, he doesn't do that. He doesn't contradict nor go against the apostleship and the teaching of the apostle Paul. It wasn't personal, Peter, but you started this. Your dissimulation, you started all of this, Peter, which is why I'm saying this in front of everybody. Let's love each other. But let's talk because you've stirred up something that you and I both know is wrong. You've stirred up hatred of the Jews against the Gentiles, which is going to lead to hatred of the Gentiles to the Jews, and nobody's going to get along. God saved us all by Jesus Christ and nothing else. Okay? Now, if you, if you want to, you're Peter, me and you are Jews. We get it. Okay? But... Christ did not save us because we keep the law. So that's what, he's, that's what he's saying there about they zealously affect you but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. They'll kick you out until you come up to their standards. Then they will let you in with them. And I've, I remember in my youth saying this, I would never let someone come in here wearing shorts during the summertime, I guess. Um, now, if someone was just outrageously immodest, I would probably be forced to deal with it. You know, somebody, somebody come in here with a bikini, that's... Okay? You know, you never know what you're going to get. Um, but I've not turned anybody away yet. So, Galatians 4.18, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. Um, and yeah, I have a zeal about me when it comes to this book, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the truth, when it comes to faith, when it comes to loving people, um, when it comes to wanting to see uh, some really bad people saved. Um, and not fall into religious traps. Um, so it is good to be zealously affected, always in a good thing. Read, the more you read your Bible and believe it, it will affect your life. And you'll be changing, you'll be changing ideologies, philosophies, you'll be changing all kinds of things about the way you used to do and think years ago. Those things will change in you. Uh, we had a young convert out at Richwoods, 
and she, she hadn't been saved very long, about six, eight months, something like that. This is when Bill Clinton was going to run for president the first time. And uh, she stood up and gave testimony, and she said, you know, before I got saved, she said, I was pro-abortion and pro-this and pro-that. And she said, now that I'm saved, I just don't, find, I just don't see the Bible anywhere. She said, I think differently now. And I'm going, amen. Amen. So then he says in verse 19, it's a very interesting statement, verse 19. Take a look at that. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Tell me what you think about that. Until Christ be formed in you. Tell me what you think about that. Before the bell rings. Today. Any time now. Until Christ be formed in you. What does that mean? Huh? The second, second creation, new creation. The, the second coming. Okay? It is, it is at second coming. That's what it's referring to. Okay? Michael is being told that we're having audio problems. We're going to have to change that computer out. So... Get ready for that. Uh, until Christ be formed in you, who else got an idea what this could mean? Notice that he uses, before he says that, notice he uses the word travail. What is that word referring to? Travail. What is this a reference to? Huh? Suffering, Suffering yeah. Yeah. Trials. Keep going. Travail. Ladies, come on. Labor. Travail is birth labor. Think of 1 Thessalonians 5. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. How? As travail cometh upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. There are more than one reference in the Bible to the time of the end associating it and linking it with a child being born. More than one. There's dozens of them. And I want you to think about this for a minute. Until Christ be formed in us, what are we, a womb? Yeah. Okay. Turn to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Now this is one of those things, if you're going, Brother Mike, I don't know about that. You just go, you just go ahead. Okay. I mean, it don't, it don't bother me. Okay. But I want you to think Bible on this. Hebrews 10. I love this because it records the words for us that Jesus says before he ever left heaven. How did David, David's the first one who wrote it down, how did David know that? The Holy Ghost. Hebrews 10, 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Notice he says, before he cometh into the world. So he says this before he is conceived in the womb of Mary. He says it before his conception. Okay, because what is Jesus? The Word. What is conception about? The joining of the female chromosomes and the male chromosomes to form the 46 chromosomes of DNA, which is the word of God, the book, okay? When he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So this is the body then of his first coming. Prepared inside of Mary's womb. And when she was near to be delivered, she brought him forth in the manger at Bethlehem, okay? Okay. What about his second coming? We are that body. We are that body. 
We're the little cells. We're the little stones who all have a package of this same DNA in us making up and forming the body of his second coming. And just as, just as a child that is ready to be delivered at nine months, 40 weeks, which that never works out mathematically, but that's what we say. Because 40 weeks is not nine months. But it is nine months, and it's 40 weeks. Anyway, so at nine months, that baby has all of the parts it needs to live outside. That child is ready. It will live outside of the womb. Okay? And so you go back and look at this. Until Christ, whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you, seems to indicate that there is a fullness of the Gentiles. There is a time when the very last Gentile is going to be saved. And that's it. Okay? You're, you should be glad you got in before the door shut. I mean, it would be nice to be the last one. I'd hate to be the first one after the last one. Beating on the door of the ark. Okay? That's, and that's kind of my, let me, what time is it? Bell ain't rung yet, but. John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you. He literally is in us. This is not metaphorical. He is in us. Uh, he says it again in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth me and I in him. And then in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. So our second birth has been initiated, but not fulfilled yet, because we don't have the new body. We are sons of God, but we're still in the womb. We haven't been, we don't have that new body yet. Not yet, but we will. When the fullness of times comes in, when the baby is ready to be born, and I believe there's two babies coming, Christ, Antichrist, okay, Ichabod, think Ichabod, he was a child, the woman travailed, she brought him forth, and they named him Ichabod, meaning the glory is departed, he represents the Antichrist, 1 Thessalonians, or 2 Thessalonians 2, Okay? He's the mystery of iniquity instead of the mystery of godliness. Let's go to prayer. Father, open our eyes. Give us some wonders from your word. We thank you, dear God, for saving us. We thank you, Lord, for zealously affecting us and for teaching us some good things. Help us love people who don't believe what we believe. Help us care about them. Help us to love them enough to see people grow, to see people saved. Help us to understand, God, that lost people don't act like saved people do. And help us to see them that way. Help us to love them and be willing to die for them as you died for them, for their salvation. Help us to care about lost people. Help us to pray for those who don't quite see eye to eye with us. Instead of making enemies everywhere, help us, dear God, to just be brethren to those with whom even we don't agree with. Soften us, but Father, confirm us in your word, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.